All right, so we're getting ready to talk about diagnosing dental caries. So before we go into that, there's a couple of definitions or a couple of topics or terms we need to talk about before we dive right into the different methods for diagnosing dental caries. So anytime we're talking about diagnosing any disease, it doesn't really matter what disease it is, there's always gonna be a gold standard method to diagnose something. Gold standard meaning it's the ideal, it's the you know time tested, the tried and true method for diagnosing whatever disease process you're looking at. Now, anytime a new method comes out, you know, if, whether it's like an advancement in technology or it's a specific technique, that method gets compared to the gold standard, right? It gets compared to that, that ideal way of doing things. And so when we're talking about comparing something to the gold standard, there's specific terms that come up and specific terms that are used, especially when you're looking at any type of literature on you know, the diagnosing process. So you may see the terms called sensitivity and specificity. So I'm gonna explain these the way that I understand them. You know, if, if the way I, I explain them doesn't make sense to you, then you're definitely gonna to wanna to look into this a little bit further and try to figure out a way that helps you understand it best. So the way I like to look at it is like this. So sensitivity and specificity, I think of them on a scale, okay? So you either have high sensitivity or low sensitivity. High specificity or low specificity. So when we're talking about sensitivity, in relation to diagnosing dental caries, we're talking about the ability of that method we're using to diagnose. It's ability to be able to determine, truly determine, when the disease process is present. So if a test or a method of diagnosing caries has high sensitivity, that means that it is really good at determining when caries is present. If it has low sensitivity, that means it's not very good at determining when caries is present. Now when we're talking about specificity in regards to dental caries, Specificity would refer to the method or the diagnosing technique we're using. That method or technique, its ability to determine when disease is actually not present or absent. So if a test has high specificity, that means that it's really good at determining when the disease process is not present. If it has low specificity, that means it's not really good at determining when the disease process is present. So trying to wrap your head around these terms, sensitivity and specificity, you know, it's one of those things, it's kind of important if you're gonna interpret some of the, the results or the tests or the literature on some of these different methods of diagnosing dental caries. Now in the um, actual handout, there's a slide that shows, you know, a test result compared to the gold standard, okay? So a lot of studies will compare the results of a diagnostic test or a method to the results of the gold standard. And basically they do this to determine how well this new method or this new test correctly identifies the true or actual disease condition. Now, if you look at this, you know, a perfect diagnostic test result in all cases would be block A and block D, okay? So that means that when the test says it's diagnosing the disease, the gold standard also says it's diagnosing the disease. And when the test says it does not diagnose a disease, the gold standard also says it does not diagnose a disease. So that would be the perfect condition, right? High sensitivity, high specificity. Now, some other combinations of things that could occur when they're looking at a test or a method compared to the gold standard could be things you see like with block B and block C on this diagram. So block B, your new method says it diagnoses the disease as present, but the gold standard says the disease is actually not present. 
So in that specific situation, you're actually getting a false positive diagnosis, meaning that your test is telling you the disease is there, but in reality, it's not there. So essentially, you're having a low sensitivity in that situation. And another thing that could happen would be what you see in block C, okay? So your diagnostic test says, I do not identify any disease present, but your gold standard says, no, there's disease present. So in that situation, you're actually getting a false negative of your new test or your new method. So in essence, you have a very low specificity. Your test is not very good at diagnosing when disease is not present. As you can see from the slide, there's a lot of ways you can diagnose caries. There's a multitude of ways you can do it. Things from very inexpensive ways of doing it in your clinic versus buying very expensive equipment. The classic ways of diagnosing caries is gonna be you know, operating in a dry field, so making sure the teeth are completely dry, no saliva present, so you can see the teeth very well, having plenty of light present, wearing magnification, whether it be loops or some other form of magnification, using an explorer for tactile feel to be able to actually feel the tooth, to feel hard versus softer areas, to feel smooth versus rougher areas. And then also, you know, comparing some of your clinical findings to the radiographs, you know, being able to tell on the radiographs if you're seeing specific carious lesions. And then you know, comparing what you see on the radiograph to what you see in the mouth, you know, using those two bits of information together to help diagnose. And then sometimes also I like to use transillumination, especially in the anterior, you know, combining transillumination with what you see clinically with what you see radiographically, using all that information together to help diagnose dental caries. You know, some other inexpensive ways of diagnosing caries could be to actually do a fissurotomy on the tooth, to just gently open up those grooves on the occlusal surface. And a lot of times that will either expose a underlying carious lesion, or it could actually just expose some staining or some just darkened tooth structure that probably could maybe benefit more from a sealant than it would an actual restoration. You could also think about doing um, orthodontic um, like separation, right? So you place some type of uh, tooth separator like they use an ortho to just kind of push those teeth gently apart and then when you remove that you can actually get a visual, direct visual inspection of that tooth to determine if the tooth does need a restoration. And you know some people like to use caries disclosing agents. I'm going to comment a little bit more on those later. I'm not a huge fan of those and I'll tell you why, but that is an option for determining if there is caries present or not. Now there's a number of electronic devices that has been invented over the last many years. You know, everything from, you know, something that's more handheld, very low profile, all the way up to something that's a little bit more bulky and takes up a little bit more real estate in your operatory. But all these instruments are designed to try to help you diagnose caries more accurately. I'm not going to talk in great detail about some of these um, simply because going back to our discussion of sensitivity and specificity, a lot of these have their own issues in correctly diagnosing when they're compared to gold standards. So I personally don't use these. Um, my only recommendation to you is if you do use some type of electronic instrument in your practice to help diagnose dental caries, you really should use that as just one, okay, just one of the ways that you help determine that diagnosis. Don't depend solely on that technology. Use everything else that you're already doing, visual examination, radiographs, you know, just being able to look at the tooth under magnification and, and good lighting, you know, using your Explorer. Use all that information in addition to that electronical instrument to help diagnose caries. I'm not a huge fan of caries detectors and here's why. When caries detectors are used on dentin, okay, dentin caries, 
Remember we talked about earlier that you have two types of dentin caries. You have infected dentin and you have affected dentin. Now caries detector is going to dye and it's going to color both infected and affected dentin. So what typically happens is, is when you use that stuff and you're removing dentin after you've you know, colored the tooth with this detector, you're actually removing more tooth structure than is necessary. Remember we said you can leave the affected dentin but you need to remove the infected? Well, caries detector dyes both of those. So you end up removing more tooth structure than you actually need to when you use those. So be very careful. You know, especially on occlusal suspicious pits and uh, fissures, you know, if it looks suspicious to me, it's kind of dark and stained, you know, that's always a tough call, even for a seasoned clinician. You know, I talked to, to some of the, the dentists I truly respect that's been practicing dentistry for years and years. You know, if you have good follow-up with your patients, you're seeing your patients on a regular basis, you know, biannually, you know, at least annually, you know, sometimes you can get away with watching some of these areas, but these can be very deceiving because it may not look very bad on the surface, but then when you open that groove up, now you're in this like huge cavern, right? This huge cavitation. So you got to look for clues like, you know, chalkiness or some graying of the enamel or the surrounding tooth structure. You know, don't just diagnose solely on the fact that it looks like it's stained. I will often elect to do a preventive resin restoration where I take a burr and I just gently open up those grooves if I'm worried about a possible you know, cavitation or if it's a high caries risk patient. I will typically take that approach as opposed to watching it in those specific types of patients. But you know, I know dentists too that say, well, fissurotomies or preventive resin restorations, those are kind of bogus. You're either going to do a filling or you're not going to do a filling. Okay, I get that mindset, but at the same time, I don't want to leave undiagnosed caries either. So it's very easy for me to take a, a, a small burr, whether it be like a 33 and a half or, you know, like a half round burr, something very small, just gently open those grooves up, explore those grooves, and then just flow a simple resin sealant in there afterwards. That's very little work on my part. And it could be a very big benefit to the patient down the road as well, so long as I do that in a very well isolated, good controlled environment. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on some of the electronic devices. However, in the handout, I do have information in there about Difodi, Fodi, Diagnodent, a lot of these instruments that's been developed to help diagnose caries a little bit more accurately. However, you know, with any good technology, there's gonna you know, be hiccups, there's gonna be things that aren't always perfect. These instruments have their limitations. And like I said earlier, if you use these, do not depend solely on these. Just use it as one of your tools in your toolkit or your toolbox to help you diagnose dental caries.